Hi, my name is Paul Sandals. Um, I'm a Java architect in the Java platform group at Oracle, and I'm going to be presenting on the Vector API in JDK 17, um, but I'm also going to talk about stuff beyond that too. So let's get started. So first of all, um, safe harbor statement, you cannot trust anything I say <laughs> moving forward. Um, so the overview, what I'm going to talk about now, have a brief introduction of the Vector API. Um, and I'm going to talk about its timeline, uh, that's what, it, what we've done in the past, the present, and potentially the future. Then I'm going to talk about a few enhancements we made to the Vector API in JDK 17. Then I'm going to go dive into an example, which will hopefully answer some questions about how to sort of use the API and how to measure its performance. And then I'm going to talk a bit about the Vector API and Project Valhalla and the interconnections between those two. So what is the Vector API first and foremost? It's, it's, it's really an API to enable explicit um, programming in a data parallel form. It means you can code, um, write an algorithm with data parallelism in mind and write that algorithm in a cross-platform way so it works across Intel chips, ARM chips, leveraging the vector hardware instructions available on those chips. Now, this is for cases where um, the runtime compiler, say Hotspot, may not be able to infer that parallelism from scalar, um, from a sequential code, or it may not be possible because the algorithm you're writing is, is, is too sophisticated. Um, so when you're writing using the Vector API, the expressions you code up using the API are generally um, reliably compiled to vector hardware instructions when available. Otherwise, it falls back to scalar code. So it will still function, but it may not function as performant if the hardware is not available to leverage. Now, if you want to get more details on the Vector API and its terminology and see some examples, I recommend you watching the replay of the prior Java Innovations talk, Vector API SIMD programming in Java that we did six months ago. Um, and that will give you a, a, a bit sort of a boot up on, on the API, the terminology and some examples. I do not have time to go into that today. So you'll get a, a better appreciation from that if you want to go back and watch that after this talk. So for correspondence, you can email the email address there, the Panama dev at openjdkjava.net. Open for questions, use cases and code examples, and for PRs, you can send them to that GitHub repo. So I encourage you to uh, communicate with us if you have questions, use cases, code examples, or proposed enhancements to the API. So let's go into the timeline here. Let's talk about what we, um, what we did in the past and what we're currently doing. So the, JD, um, the Vector API is an incubating API, which means we, it's an, kind of, you can think of it as experimental. The API is evolving. We're distributing it into the JDK to encourage people to use it to provide feedback. Uh, we first incubated this API into JDK 16 with support across Intel, ARM, Neon, and PowerPC platforms. And that was our first, first go at doing this. And then we, we're going to have a second incubator that's integrated into JDK 17, which includes enhancements to the API from 16 and a, a, a couple of other enhancements I'm going to talk about. The thing I want to highlight here is when we introduced it into 16, there were performance gaps. We hadn't, we hadn't completed all the support for the hardware and the instructions available on the hardware. And we significantly closed that gap in 17. There's still more to do, but that gap is getting smaller and smaller. So when you write code using the Vector API, it, it more reliably translates to Vector hardware instructions. Now in the future, we will plan to do another JEP. And we have a candidate JEP already, already available. And in this JEP, we're going to expand or broaden the support on hardware uh, for the Vector API. So we plan to support the scalar vector extensions for the ARM platform. And we also plan to expand the vector hardware instruction support for masking as well. So we're, we're filling in yet more of the gaps in the Vector API, leveraging more and more of the hardware. I'd like to point out on the mask vector operations, there's been great and strong collaboration between ARM, Intel, and Oracle engineers. It's great to see that kind of collaboration happen in OpenJDK, sort of competing and also cooperating together to make Java better. 
And I think there'll be subsequent incubators after this that are likely proposed. We want to integrate with Panama's um, uh, memory API for loading and storing. And there's likely to be other API and performance enhancements. And I'll, I will allude to some of those at the end when talking about Project Valhalla. Now, what's the end game here? Um, we will keep incubating and enhancing the API with the rights to change it based on feedback and, and so forth until certain features of Project Valhalla are in the JDK, primarily around unified generics and what we're currently calling primitive classes. We need these to um, make the API better and the API we would like. Again, I'll discuss that towards the end of the, of the presentation. So what enhancements did we um, add into JDK 17? Based on feedback, um, there were developers ex experimenting with the API to try and do UTF, example would be UTF-8 character decoding or encoding. And they, they were trying this and they were coming up with some deficiencies. And one of the problem was trying to load um, characters from say a character array and then operating on that. And we don't represent characters um, as vectors, we represent them as short values. And so we need to load character arrays as shorts and operate on them. And so what we needed to do was add loads and stores between characters and short vectors. And when, we, and when you have that, we need to operate on these short vectors using unsigned operations because characters are unsigned. So we added these two small features to enable better support for the kinds of vectorized uh, um, character decoding and encoding. Um, and with that, we also added um, for completeness, the ability to translate between uh, byte vectors and Boolean arrays as well. And in a sense, you can translate between short vectors and character arrays. So we're filling in a little gap there. Small, modest API improvements. A larger improvement we added, which is really an implementation change here, was integration with Intel's short vector math library. Um, Intel provides this as a standard data library for C and C++, and it provides optimal support for vectorized instructions for trigonometric um, functions or transcendental functions, exponential, um, square root, and so forth. Now, this is this is really good for for use in, in algorithms like Black Scholes, uh, used in finance. And Intel have contributed the assembler source code to OpenJDK. So OpenJDK doesn't have any upstream dependencies on this. It comes bundled in and it's bundled in for currently Linux and Windows, and maybe we'll do Mac later. And this shared library within distributed in the JDK image actually is about, um, it's not small, it's about one megabyte uh, for all these uh, vectorized instructions. And it's only present if you include the incubator module so if you, you, if you J-link your image without the vector module present, it won't be present in your image. You don't pay for that size cost. So what this gives you is superior performance. For say, if you're doing a, a, an ATAN operation or a cosine or an exponential, you'll get superior performance when this library is present. And if it's not present, we'll just fall back to the scalar code. We'll fall back to math.atan if the SVML library is not present and it can't use the vectorized ATAN function, for example. And we, we, we will hopefully um, commit an example for Black Scholes um, uh, benchmark in the near future where you can see the use of this, um, uh, this library in action. So what I'm gonna do now is dive into an example um, of vectorizing arrays.hash code. Uh, a common, uh, uh, two common questions we get when people are experimenting with the vector API is, how do I know if my vectorized code is faster than my scalar code? Or another one is, how do we know if the vectorized code generates vector hardware instructions? Now this is, um, especially when you're dealing with um, experimental, or, uh, or implementations that aren't quite complete, it's easy to fall into gaps where we haven't, we haven't fully optimized yet. And the developer needs to know that. So for the first question, you write a JMH benchmark. And for the second question, we use JMH's integration with say perfasm on Linux or dtraceasm on Mac to analyze the generated code and then see what's produced. And I'm going to show some examples of that now. So I've prepared um, an example code for the vectorized uh, implementation of vectorizing arrays.hash code. 
It's available on GitHub for you to look at and play with. And I'm going to show this code now and to explain a little bit about it and, and show how I run it and show how I use JMH. And from that, you can apply that to your own examples. Okay, let's have a look at the code. I'm going to switch to my IDE where I have the, uh, um, the project open up. I have my um, project here and I have my single file here, which is a JMH benchmark. And I, so what I've done is I put the my vectorized implementation of raise.hash code into this benchmark here. So I've got a, a class here, it's annotated with various JMH um, annotations. The key thing I want to point out here is I've added an annotation to when I run the benchmark to add this um, runtime argument, which says I'm using the vector module because um, the vector module is an incubating module, you have to explicitly add it so that you can use it. Otherwise it's not visible uh, to the code you use. So that's that's one important thing to, to highlight here. So let's look a little bit at the scalar benchmarks. So when you're writing JMH benchmarks, you, you write a method, you annotate it with the benchmark, it says, hey, I want you to measure this for me. So what I want to do is I want to measure the arrays.hash code and the argument passed in is a byte array. And I just initialize that byte array to a certain size and then I fill it with a bunch of random values. Now let's look at the arrays.hash code implementation here. And zoom in and have a, a little look at it. Okay, so this is using the standard hash code implementation in Java that's specified, unfortunately. At the time it was written, it might've been a good hash code, but today this is a terrible hash code algorithm. But unfortunately we're stuck with it because we specify that it has to be this algorithm. So we're stuck, it's not great. What does it do? It says, well, given an element of a byte, add it to my prior result multiplied by 31 and initialize the result to one. So it just goes through all of the elements doing this, multiplying the prior result by 31, adding an element and then returning the result like this. Not a great algorithm, but we're stuck with it. So how can we improve this algorithm? If we want to vectorize it, can, will vectorization actually result in improvements to the scalar code? So let's find out. So one thing to observe when looking at this hash code algorithm is actually it's a polynomial uh, to the power of 31 based on the, the length of the array and the constants are the contents of the array. So we've got a clue here of how we can actually work out how to vectorize this, this code from the scalar code we saw, which was here. So how can we vectorize that? That is in effect a polynomial in proportion to the length of the array. So once we got that, we can say, well, maybe we can manually enroll this and implement it in scalar code and manually enroll it just to give us some clues. So we can re-implement the algorithm like this in another benchmark and we can unroll it. And this gives us a clue about how we can vectorize. We, we've effectively split it up or crudely parallelized it in a data parallel way. I've, I've had eight operations on the array here and I can stride over the array eight times. And then at the end, I stride over the, the value less than at the tail of the array less than eight in, in, in the same algorithm we saw in the arrays.hash code implementation. So that we can do that. I verify it produces the same results. And once we got that, we can say, ha, ah, I've got a vector here. I could got a vector of eight elements. And so we can write an equivalent vectorized loop. I'm calling this one vector 64 reduced in loop. Now I'm going to briefly go through the, the use of the API here, not in detail. So you'd have to watch the prior talk I talked about and then play around with the API a bit, but I'll explain a bit as I go along. So what we're doing here when we're using the vector API, we're trying to emulate this scale unrolled scalar code here. So what we want to do is we want to load bytes and operate on those bytes. So we're going to go through our um, array. We're going to go through the length of the array as before and use something called the byte 64 species, which is a factory for vectors whose elements are bytes and whose size is 64 bits. So it's basically, I want to load eight bytes at a time and stride through eight times 
straight through by steps of eight into the array. So what we do is we load eight bytes into a 64-bit vector, like so. And then the next step is, well, we need to convert these bytes to integers, because if we go back to the scalar code, h is an integer. Um, so here, what's happening is each of these byte values is getting converted to an int value. And so we need to do the same. So we need to convert eight bytes into eight ints, which means we're going to expand it to a 256 vector, 64 times four, because uh, there's four bytes in integer. So we use another operation. Instead of get a byte vector, we cast it into an int vector like so. And then we do our operation on it. We multiply it by a vector of constants, which correspond to the powers of 31 here that are pre-calculated. And then we reduce the vector by an add operation to sum all the values up, just like we were doing here, like so, summing them all up. And then we add it to the 30, 31 to the power of eight here, actually doing this one. And then we assign it back to H again. And then we go to the tail. And that's effectively a fairly simple transformation going on, which effectively um, is the same calculation, but vectorized. And notice we're reducing H in the loop like so. Now we can do the same. Notice here we're reducing H in a scalar, but there's an alternative implementation we can do, which is to keep H as a vector. So instead we can have another implementation which says initializing my H vector, first value is one, all the others are zero. We do the same loading from the byte array, same casting to an int, int vector from the byte vector we loaded. And instead we keep H's in the vector. So we do the same the multiplication and we, we do the multiplication by a bunch of constants in H and add it together and keep H in the vector. And at the end of the loop, we reduce it. So we pull the reduction outside of the loop. And then we process the tail like so forth. Now, once we got this, we can go even further and we can unroll and we can stride by 16 bytes at a time. And we can do two loads of each byte vector and keep two H vectors going at once within the loop. And at the end of it, we reduce both and sum them up. We can take this even further and go and unroll in four steps. So we have four H vectors and we have four loads from byte arrays and so forth and four reductions at the end. Now, when you unroll like this, it, it, it allows for more optimizations by the CPU by reducing data dependency so it can speculate more and run uh, and run fast, run the instructions faster without effectively stalling or blocking. So this is what unrolling actually gives you. And we want to know whether this actually is of benefit to us in this sense. We know we have a number of hardware registers on the machine. So we know we have enough, enough hardware registers to hold H, well, H ones to four, all of the bytes and int vectors in registers. There's about 16 or more of the vector registers we can use. So we know this. So once we've got all this, we have about four benchmarks, four vector benchmarks and two scalar benchmarks. We need to run it. So I'm gonna, I have some results I previously produced, but I, if you go to this, um, code base and have a look. There's a command there that you can run to use Java 17. I'm gonna run it from the line here. So I'm using um, a recent build of Java 17. That will be released soon. And then I'm gonna run, just run the benchmark to show you. I'm not gonna wait till it finishes, but I just wanna show you that it's actually running. So the JMH is actually running and it's running each of those methods with the annotated batch benchmark and measuring its time, how many operations per millisecond does it take? So the, the, the faster you go, the higher the number of operations per milliseconds it takes. So let's look at the, um, the results here from what I previously ran. So what we see is the scalar code here, the erase.hash code is about uh, 1,280 operations per millisecond. That's for a, a byte array of 124 elements. We notice that the scalar and roll code is actually slower, about twice as slow as the scalar code. And then we start looking at the vectorized code and we notice an immediate improvement. 
you notice that the, the, the reduced in loop back to the first one I showed you is maybe three, three X faster. So we, we can get, say, hey, vectorization is working in some sense here. But what we notice is the, the vector 64, the first one that we reduced in the, in the um, reduced outside of the loop is actually slower than this one. So there's something going on here. I don't have time to get into. There's a difference between these two. And that, that kind of surprises me. I'm not quite sure what it is. I have to do some investigation as to why. Now, if we do the manual unrolling, we get even faster because we're breaking uh, data dependencies. And so we, we find that when we unroll twice, we get even more, and when we unroll four, we get even more. And so it gets to maybe six X faster than the original scalar code, which is quite impressive for a, a, a poor hash code algorithm, I think. Now, um, should you have to do this unrolling yourself? Uh, maybe we can enhance C2 to help in that regard, but in some cases, it's actually hard to determine how to enroll this and how to do the reductions outside the loop. Okay, so when we're looking at these vector, vector code, you might want to ask what's going on? What is C2 doing? Are vector hardware instructions generated? If they are, are they the most optimal ones? And this is how we might analyze the differences between these two. So I'm gonna give you some clues about what to do there. So the, the trick is to use, um, I'm using a Mac, so I'm gonna be using a, a D-trace as a profiler. And I'm just going to profile the, the vector 64 um, benchmark. And I'm also going to limit the loop I'm rolling. So um, it gives me a chance to show you a smaller snippet of code that is, that is hot code. So I can, I can run that in JMH. Um, let me just start to make sure that I have access. So we can run that. And, 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 what it's doing is it's running dtrace asm in the background and it's it's effectively sampling the program counter of the benchmark and once it's finished we can see that uh, jmh will tell you where the hottest methods are and then it will start showing assembler code generated and then we can see quite nicely the hot loop of that um, benchmark we can see that uh, almost uh, 90 something percent of the time is spent in this small bit of assembler code because it's not unrolled, it's quite small and easy to see. Now I'll switch to the, the larger method, uh, the larger um, snapshot here that I created earlier so you can see it a bit better and what's going on. Here's our hot loop. And we can see that the assembler here, this VMOD Q corresponds to loading the byte vector from an array. This corresponds to loading um, the vector, loading the address of the, of the constant vector named this here. Here's a multiplication. Here's the conversion of the byte vector to the int vector, like so. Here's another loading uh, address of the constant. Here's the multiplication. Here's a summation. And here's the addition of striding through eight bytes at a time. We can pair with at the end of our limit. Otherwise, we jump back, and that's it. And so you can get a really good sense of that the vector API is doing the right thing here. It's generating good instructions. It's generating intuitive instructions to what you'd expect uh, from the code. Has left some instructions here, um, descriptions, so you know how I how I generated the assembler code. You need to use a library called HSDIS which is accessible uh, from the code base and has instructions about how you can build it and what to do with Mac uh, to place it to overcome Mac's SIP um, restrictions. So hopefully that gives you a good sense of the questions I um, discussed here. How do we know if a vectorized code is faster than scalar code? Let's write a benchmark. So I wrote a benchmark for raise.hash code and I wrote the vectorized code there. And how do I know if the vectorized code generates hardware instructions? I use the features of JMH to look at those instructions. So I don't expect most developers to do this, but if you're experimenting with the vector API and you're encountering issues or you want to know it and you want to help us find out what's going on, I, I encourage you to bring benchmarks to us that we can analyze and, and, and look at and, and try and identify performance potholes, or just to say, hey, this worked really well, and to show us examples. That would be great too. Okay, now on to the Vector API and Project Valhalla. Uh, 
This is all about making vectors proper values with a better API. So I showed in the, in the JMH code vectors, you saw a vector type there, um, and you notice that it has a, a, a generic type on there. Um, and top class of the vector API is vector of E, and E uh, is effectively um, a box type of the primitive type that we actually want. So E is one of a byte short integer long float of double. And then we have subtypes of vector. So we have int vector is a subtype of vector of integer. Um, integer is effectively the box of int. And we have to refer to box primitive types because the generics will not allow us to refer to vector of int, which is really what we want to say. So we have to refer to the box instead. Now Valhalla will bring unification to the type system. And we need Valhalla to simplify the vector API and to express more accurately what we mean. We want to say vector of int. And perhaps with no or simplified subtypes, maybe we don't need to say int, maybe we don't have to say int vector in the public API anymore. Vector of int is sufficient. Now, when we want to make these changes, such changes are likely to be source and binary incompatible with existing code. So we want to reserve the right to change the vector API and make breaking changes. Hence why it's gonna be an incubating status until features of Valhalla are ready. When the features of Valhalla are ready, we can enhance the API. And in the interim, we may be able to enhance the API experimentally to help verify and to validate um, Valhalla features. So vector of E, an instance of it, is a vector of E is really a value, what we call a value-based class. Its instances have no identity. So it's a special value-based class in the implementation. So it, it treats it with no identity, and this may be confusing. So you may be able to um, test that V1 is equal to V1 pointer pointer wise, and it could return false. And that is extremely confusing. And the lack of the reason why we do this is we want to have a lack of identity of these of these um, instances of vector, so we can have reliable optimizations. Now, this is something we don't want to put give to people as a finalized API until values are ready. We need Valhalla to make vectors proper values, and so that we this kind of um, identity comparison is not so strange or unusual because Valhalla will bring. Um, values to the platform as a standardized feature. Now this vector, instance of vector of values, it's kind of a special value. It's not a value of say uh, a point of X and Y, say, or a complex number of real and imaginary. It's a special value that won't scalarize into its component parts. It's effectively a sequence of bits. So it's a special kind of value and we would need to en enhance Valhalla to understand what vectors mean with regards to that, but also but in other cases, it, it has similar properties to other values and we'll be able to share common code between those two, I hope, as we go forward. Now for the final one is that E and E is a fixed set of, in E and vector E is a fixed set of box primitive types. So can we expand E to support other kinds of primitive types? What if we wanted vector of half float. So um, in machine learning use cases, it's sometimes useful to operate on floating point numbers that are half the size of normal floating point numbers we're used to. Um, in Java floats, they are 32 bit, but sometimes it's more efficient performance wise when in, in performing training or inference on machine learning models to represent floating point numbers in 16 bits instead, half the bandwidth half the memory usage. Um, maybe we could add a vector of half float, where half float is uh, a primitive class, numerical primitive class that uh, performs operations on 16-bit floating point values. And if we were using, say, for example, an Intel um, hardware Sapphire Rapids, which I believe is, um, is announced but and available ne maybe next year, they have hardware support for operations on half floats. And we could add half float support to vector 
and get vectorized operations on half floats for machine learning use cases. But we need Valhalla to support custom value types for the vector elements. If we want to add a half float, we'd add it as a primitive class. We can't add it today in the platform and pretend it's yet another kind of value like we do for vector. We'd like to do this properly. So Valhalla will open this up for us. In the interim, we can still experiment and we will plan to experiment in the Panama repos with this, but we won't have the um, advantage of doing so with Valhalla yet. And until Valhalla is ready, we can't really support this properly. So that's three reasons I gave for why we need Valhalla for the Vector API to some exit incubation.